Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Pedro Barada, and I am the Executive Director of the Future Skills Center. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here today and to thank you for your interest in today's topic, namely how we can leverage, grow, and shape LMI so that it is increasingly relevant and accessible to Canadians navigating through the recovery and beyond. I want to start today with a special hello to our friends uh, out on the West Coast in BC, uh, who, as we know, are dealing with devastating floods. Um, we're watching from the rest of the country with great concern, and uh, we're sending you strength and best wishes for a safe recovery. Um, so uh, I want to welcome all of you here today. I'm, I'm very excited that we're featuring some great Future Skills Center partners. Uh, in a moment, you're going to meet uh, Tony Bonin, Director of Research at Data and Analytics from the Labor Market Information Center, affectionately known as LMIC. Uh, Gazal Nilkazar as Chief Projects Officer from the Hospitality Training Worker Center. And my good friend, Brianna O'Reilly, Program Manager at Petro LMI. Uh, but before we start, I just wanted to share some housekeeping items with all of you. On your Zoom screen, you will see a toolbar. It gives you options to interact with us throughout the session. The chat box is open, so feel free to use that chat box to state your name and where you're from. And I see that some of you have already started to do that. So thank you for your early adoption. Uh, you can use the chat box or the Q&A option to ask questions. We will be monitoring both channels. And we will draw on questions and comments uh, from your discussion with the panel. So please, uh, we welcome you to join the discussion throughout the event. A simultaneous French translation is also available. And to access it, please select your audio feed from the interpretation button on your Zoom toolbar. By default, it will be off. But you can choose either the English or French audio to change that. And this session is being recorded. So if you have colleagues who are unable to attend, they can access the recording and we will make sure to share it with you afterwards. So with all of that done, um, I would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that I am currently on the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. The treaties that cover these territories include the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes and the Upper Canada Treaties. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. And as a first generation immigrant myself, I reflect on how grateful I am to indigenous peoples for their stewardship of this beautiful land that has welcomed me and that I now call home. And I am committed to reciprocating this gift by continuing to deepen my own understanding of the local indigenous communities and to work both personally and professionally to be a part of the much needed healing and rebuilding toward reconciliation. And I know that across Canada, our teams, our partners, and all of you similarly gather on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. So thank you for joining me in that. And uh, now to today's topic. Uh, we, are at, um, uh, we are at the two and a half year mark at the Future Skills Center. Uh, we've been working hard at building a future-focused skills innovation hub in Canada, and our goal is to work with the skills ecosystem, who are all of you, to help prepare workers and employers for ongoing labor market changes. We are bringing research into the future skills for, we're building a network and community of practice so that we can all share and learn, and we're sourcing innovation pilots on skills from the ground up and starting to take some of this work to scale. So far, uh, we've built a portfolio of just over 140 pilot projects, and we are now lucky to have partnerships that range um, uh, just about every, every sector of the economy, um, every region of Canada, uh, and also uh, touch on a number of populations with a specific focus 
on underrepresented groups. Now, as we all know, um, many sectors of the Canadian economy are, are, going, are uh, undergoing profound fundamental changes uh, due to factors like the rapid adoption of all kinds of technology. It's a long list. Uh, also demographic shifts that have not gone away, global market changes, uh, which have included really an accentuation on a shift to a green economy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And to navigate all of these changes, it would help to have good data and reliable information about where we're coming from, the context we're currently living in, and a sense of where we're going. And the panelists that you're gonna hear from today live and breathe exactly this challenge. They live in the world of labor market information or LMI. And when we talk about LMI, it of course refers to a wide range of data about available job opportunities, in-demand skills, demographic information about the current workforce and activities related to employment, education and training services. This is a really critical priority for Future Skills Center. In fact, it's one of our four strategic priorities because we know that if we're going to help Canadians navigate changing times, then we have to provide accurate, practical, and timely information to Canadian employers, workers, and policymakers to support their skills development strategies. So we are working with LMI experts and partners to provide that data, those tools, and those resources to help the skills ecosystem understand changing skills needs and shape evidence-based responses. Today, we get to spotlight some of the amazing work uh, that our partners are doing and that we're very excited about. And it does represent just one slice, a really important slice of a range of activities that we're working in. And I did want to mention our consortia partners uh, at the Conference Board of Canada um, because we did something really cool last spring. We, land, we launched Opportune Next. It is a free online career navigation tool. It is designed to help job placement professionals, job seekers, and employers to quickly and easily accept, uh, uh, explore viable career transition pathways. So it lets users enter basic information like their job title, and then the tool maps career options from a database of more than 13 billion job characteristics that require similar skills, abilities, experience, and all that factoring in five-year forecasts of sector and industry prospects. I've done it myself. Apparently, I would do really well in healthcare management, um, but of course, so would just about all of you, as health is predicted to be one of the fastest growing sectors into the future. Um, uh, I invite you to try out Opportunex. It's really a uh, really cool tool. And uh, for all of you who are LMI nerds, um, the engine that's running in the background uh, that essentially borrowed from uh, the ONET framework um, and adopted it to the Canadian environment uh, is just a really powerful uh, backbone to that tool that I think is going to really help us uh, map out uh, career paths. Another exciting and recent initiative we launched in August is the Practitioner Data Initiative. Um, and this is a pan-Canadian project that we at FSC are, uh, are, are doing with Blueprint, our consortia partners. Blueprint is leading this work. And along with nine community-based workforce development agencies, we're focusing on helping community service organizations across Canada better understand how they can use their own data in order to improve their decision-making and enhance service delivery to their communities. And lastly, um, and this is a project you'll be hearing about today, uh, we are partnering with our good friends at the Labor Market Information Council to help Canadians navigate the changing world of work through an open cloud-based data repository, or what we call a data hub, that will put a wealth of data at the fingertips of career guidance practitioners so that they, in turn, these practitioners, can help Canadians make well-informed decisions about their career path. Uh, in fact, uh, the Learning Nation report, uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, ESDC's minister um, uh, in, in Ottawa, uh, this was uh, one of the primary and one of the first recommendations that emerged out of the Learning Nation report. And we are really proud and happy that with LMIC, we were actually the first actionable recommendation coming out of the gates from the learning from the minister's Learning Nation report. Uh, that, uh, that started to put some momentum uh, behind some of the great recommendations uh, in that blueprint. So if you're interested in learning more about all the work that we are doing, 
Uh, we do have an LMI webpage on the Future Skills Center website, and it has a lot more information about all of these initiatives and why we are putting such an emphasis on uh, this as a critical priority for future skills. So um, I will now uh, turn things over to our moderator for the panel discussion. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Ron Sampson, is Senior Manager of Research and Evaluation at Magnet, a really important Future Skills Center partner. Ron will introduce our guests and take it from here. Ron, over to you. Thanks, Pedro. Really excited about the conversation and thanks for such a great introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm really glad that so many people from across the country are representing this conference today from many different parts of the skills ecosystem. I think it's really timely that we're having this conversation as Pedro's kind of already talked about, about all the different development and initiatives that are occurring in the LMI, Canadian LMI space. Traditionally closed off to economists and researchers, new advancements in labor market information is bringing up, providing opportunities to bring the data more into the hands of job seekers, students, and practitioners. While we're still in the early stages of in LMI, and you can see our new tools, there's good reason to believe when this information is given to job seekers and to people in the field, that it can support the field in a variety of ways. This will allow for more timely and targeted use of data, more granular information about skills, qualifications, and jobs down to a community level, and more effectively spot out trends and changes that are occurring in a rapidly changing labor market. While this data has a lot of benefits, it's not a single silver bullet that will solve all our labor market challenges in Canada. This particularly relates to issues of systemic racism, discrimination, and equity. Furthermore, uh, while career decisions are very much complex and very much individualized. There's good reason to believe that when Canadians are provided with accurate information, it can support them develop in-demand careers, in-demand skills for in-demand careers they aspired for. But before I introduce the panelists, because I guess I'm gonna transition now to into panelists, I have two questions I would like to ask all of you. So we have some poll questions just to kind of kick off the event, see how everybody's kind of familiarity with labor market information. So first question, how would you rate your knowledge of the labor market? Second question is how relevant is labor market information to your work? So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it. But I think as we more and more look at LMI and look about how we use this into daily practice, I think that's where we're going to yield the benefits of LMI. Because without kind of using LMI, I think when the labor market is changing so rapidly, we're kind of making decisions in the dark. Okay. So we'll just wait a more minute and we'll take all those polls and just see where everybody at is in terms of LMI. It's, uh, it's quite a, you know, what includes LMI, what doesn't include LMI. And when we really thought about today's panel discussion, we were thinking about next wave LMI and that's really the job scraping data where we can now get more granular and detailed information on, on, on job postings and content. And how we are combining data from different data sets together. So it seems like almost 60% have somewhat knowledge and some people are just learning or somewhat familiar in terms of the first question, how would you rate LMI? Uh, how aware of you are, what's your knowledge of LMI? In terms of your second question, how relevant is LMI to, to your job or to your work? It seems like 90% of you, it is central to the role or use it occasionally. So I think what we can all know is that even if we're using it occasionally, or it's really critical to our roles, this is something that's really important for us to spot out kind of issues in the labor market and make us make more informed decisions. So now that we've kind of kind of gotten what our familiarity of your LMI, I'm going to introduce you all to the panelists. And today we brought three individuals from industry, research, and frontline service delivery, which each of them will bring their own different perspectives and lenses about how LMI matters and how they're using it. So first, we have Brian O'Reilly from Energy Safety Canada, 
She's leading their LMI Petro division. She has extensive work experience working with large firms and has a really good understanding of what LMI matters to employers and to job, sec job, job seekers in the energy industry. We have Gazelle Niknazar, who works at HWTC, who's been in the world field of workforce development for over 20 years. She's currently building an LMI tool for displaced workers in the hospitality sector. And finally, we have Tony Bonin from Labor Market Information Center, who leads their team of labor economists. LMIC, as Pedro mentioned, is working on an FSC project that is creating a data hub that will bring different sources of labor marketing together into a repository where researchers, product designers, and career practitioners can design new LMI solutions together. So now that you know my panelists, I'm gonna start off the conversation by asking them a few questions. Hi, Gazelle, hi, Tony, hi, Brianne. So why do you think now is the important time to talk about labor market information? I can maybe jump in on that because my bias here is that uh, it's always time to talk about labor market information, but that's coming from the Labor Market Information Council where this is what we talk about all the time. So maybe a bit circular, but I think most of the panelists uh, would tend to agree that after a year and a half of you know, major disruptions, uh, uh, still figuring out just how disrupted labor markets have been over the past uh, 18 months due to COVID, um, there's a lot of change and the dust is still settling. We've seen massive shifts in terms of the employment across different sectors. Um, and many people are considering that balance between work and life and where they want to spend their time as maybe being quite different or shifted from where it was before. Uh, many people returning to training and education. Um, and I think now is the time that we want to be supporting those people and making those decisions with the uh, maximum amount of quality information possible. Um, so I think that's the stage we're at right now. And as we emerge from this crisis and enter the post COVID world, whatever that might look like, there's still a lot of unanswered questions right now in terms of the data and where we go from here. And so I think it's very important that we start setting up the labor market information systems to address those questions that we know are coming down the line. Perfect, thanks, Tony. Much like uh, Tony, Petrol and I tends to have a bias towards uh, continuing labor market information all the time. Um, right now in energy, we're seeing a lot of transition in the nature of work. And that nature of work transition is leading to different requirements in the skills themselves and the occupations needed. So uh, labor market information is fantastic for helping direct job seekers to where, where the future is going in the industry and what skills might be in demand in the future. Um, we're also seeing a, a big increase in interest in the gig economy and people changing careers regularly. Um, so I think that's something that's changing over time and pe people are more interested in having a wide variety of experiences versus staying their entire careers at one place. And so understanding how their skills are transferable and what their career path might look like is more important now than ever. Thanks, Brianne. So maybe I'll jump up into the next question. What role do you think LMI plays in supporting job seekers, students, and underrepresented groups? Um, hi everyone. Um, I think the, vol the, vol the volume, the amount, the sources, and the speed at which LMI is produced this day and age um, is really overwhelming for most vulnerable job seekers. And if you're calling them vulnerable, it's probably because they've had trouble navigating that information productively um, in the first place. And that's why they end up often in. Uh, in, in relationship to workforce development intermediaries like HWTC or others um, who have that capacity to turn labor market information into labor market intelligence and help them navigate the, the, their careers, their personal careers as best as possible um, given the information that we empower them with and help them navigate. Perfect, thanks Gazelle. Brianne, Tony, would you like to follow up on this question? Uh, 
I think for us, uh, LMI can help um, new graduates especially to see what their career paths can be. Um, if you get an education in a certain subject, uh, for engineering, for example, your paths are much more diverse than you might think when you're leaving high school and entering that post-secondary. So LMI helps, um, helps those job seekers and students and underrepresented groups to see what the wide variety of, of opportunities might be. I mean, I think Opportunext, as, uh, as Pedro mentioned, is a good example of a, a tool out there that can help people um, see all of their possible paths. Um, and, you know, I think the other piece is sharing that those possibilities and those transferable skills with educators and with community agencies to help job seekers and underrepresented groups uh, to make sure that they're highlighting the right, um, the right education and the right transferable uh, skills that they've developed and give them the most opportunities upon graduation or um, yeah, upon entering the labor market. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I really believe that for most part, people have gotten labor market information through their social networks and groups. And, and now we can really give them, you know, more accurate information of what's happening and just what jobs are available. Because I know when I was a student, I don't know, many years ago, uh, I had no idea of the wide range of jobs and what skills were transferable. So maybe I'll jump on to the next question. What sorry, I, oh yeah, go ahead, Tony. Sorry, I just wanted to add to that point because I think it's it's very important in terms of servicing uh, and designing programs and projects aimed at underrepresented groups and those who have faced barriers to employment. Um, and just to add or you know contextualize a little bit my first point about the major disruption for the past year and a half, there are long-term trends in the job market, uh, barriers to employment, systemic racism, sexism, as was mentioned earlier, um, as well as demographic, demographic shifts that are happening, uh, baby boomers retiring, for example, all of which existed before the pandemic and are coming back now. I mean, they never really went away. We just didn't see them on the top line of the, the labor uh, market numbers, basically. And those challenges are reappearing and designing our tools around those uh, as Brandon and Gazelle were saying, I think it's, it's critical there. Yeah, I really, you know, based on my experience at the community level, I think with the new level of granular information, we can be a lot more uh, responsive to the changes in labor market information. And, and really much at the community level, we can even identify, you know, which employers are hiring and what are the most in-demand jobs and what are the postings and what are the skill requirements. So leading off of that kind of comment, I think, what excites you all most about LMI and what value does LMI offer frontline practitioners? Um, for me, this, uh, the, the fact that the technology has advanced so much and the, um, it allows us to have current data going from relying on forecasts onto not now casting, being able to access the opportunities right away where they are. Um, has been a huge shift for us, even as early as early or as late uh, as March 2020, weeks before I was writing a proposal projecting huge employment gains and growth in the hospitality industry uh, based on forecasts that were that was provided to me. Um, and when you know the pandemic hit, obviously everyone knows what's happened to the hospitality industry. And two years later, we are on a weekly basis are impacted by decisions at policy and, and, and health levels um, in the sector. And on a, I want to say on a daily basis, there are new career opportunities that arise or diminish within the sector, and we can't rely on forecasts um, anymore, as unreliable as they were back in the day anyway. Um, so this idea that now casting artificial intelligence and um, a, a growing interest in this information at all um, is, is a huge, exciting thing for me in this sector and for our participants. Thanks. Yeah, Lisa. I think the improved um, tools and resources that are out there are impacting our decision-making ability, which is a great thing. Um, the responsiveness uh, to Gazelle's point about uh, how much COVID changed things and how quickly COVID changed things. 
uh, the energy industry was no different. Uh, well, uh, we had the added oil prices uh, that plummeted um, and we had we were in the process of producing a 10 year forecast that just got completely set aside because none of the assumptions made sense anymore. Um, so I think though the the ongoing monitoring, the LMIC dashboards, the tools and resources that are available that track real time jobs um, with the stats can regular data are, are giving us a better picture um, more so now than ever before. Um, on our side, we're looking at um, new ways of presenting that information. We know not everyone loves looking at a uh, data dashboard. Um, and so, although we still have one, we also have a lot of storytelling and a lot of real people who have made career changes and who are telling the stories about their career paths. Um, with FSC, we have launched a VR um, tool that shows people what the nature of work is like, which in energy is really important to try to do in a safe way. And a lot of times in the past, workers' first experience on a rig was their first day on the job. And a lot of people didn't last because even if you tell people it's remote and it's cold and you're going to be living in a trailer, they think, well, it's worth it for the money. Um, but you put on a headset and you see yourself there and you look around and you're like, it's snow and cold and prairie. It provides a lot more context and experience for people. And uh, so I think we're right at the cusp of producing more resources to help job seekers and help people understand what might be a fit for them. And I think that's really exciting. That's a really, yeah, I, the context of the job is so important. And Brianne, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, right now we haven't been able to get that information from job posts and granted, but, you know, and I think that's where, when we talk about practitioners, the, the things that, you know, LMI can do well and understanding what does LMI do well and what currently does it not do well and where are those gaps and how can career service practitioners and people in the field build, bridge those gaps. And as much as LMI can be useful, I think employer engagement is always going to be needed. So maybe I'll jump on to the next questions and that brings a se great segue to our next questions. What are some of the limitations and challenges existing with LMI? On that one, I mean, this is something we deal with all the time at LMIC, the limitations in terms of how frequently the data is updated or how granular or localized you can get with the data. There is always going to be a limitation like this with the data. I think there's lots of ways that the Canadian statistical system could be improved over the long term. But even with all of the improvements on like a wish list that we could put together, I think the type of sort of qualitative story based information that Brianne was talking about is always going to be essential. And it's going to be that contextualized information that people will need to sort of navigate the system and, and make more informed decisions. Because it's not just about some forecast of potential growth or what the current wages is that's relevant for sure. And that you know, needs to be given to people in a way that they can understand, digest, and compare to alternatives. But you still always need this sort of contextualized, story-based kind of what is what can I see myself doing in 5, 10, 15 years or so on? I, I love the VR, AR uh, type of tools that are out there. And those type of, of tools are always going to be driven by the, the sector, the, the businesses, employers who know that stuff and can design that. At LMIC, we're in this data all the time, but you know, it, it's at a bird's eye level compared to uh, what the actual employers are doing and the knowledge that they have. Um, and just to add one other piece to that, I would say the single biggest challenge in terms of the data piece, and this was touched on a little bit already, is skills. We don't have great data on skills. There, there are good tools out there. Um, there are good sources of information like ONET that's uh, imbued into the Opportunity Next tool that Pedro had mentioned before. Um, there's data, uh, job posting information on skills and work requirements, all very rich all very different, different sources, and it requires a lot of sort of parsing and detailed knowledge right now to make use of that while keeping the caveats and limitations in mind. And I think that's where improvements need to be made. And again, I think the employer side, those who are looking to hire, 
uh, need to all be brought together with the data folks to really develop like a, a nice system that people can make use of. Um, because ultimately that's what we want, not just a pure academic <laughs> summary of what skills are out there, but actually something that's practical for folks. Perfect, thanks, Tony. So I'll ask one more question, then I'll move into the Q&A section of the portion, because I think we've got a lot of questions and thank you so much for writing your great questions. So I'll move into them pretty shortly after I ask one question. So as we talk about, Tony, as you were talking about new tools and everything, I think we're talking about here about the next frontier about LMI. So where do you, what do you think LMI will look like and how will it be used in the next three to five years? I can take that one to start, Tony. <laughs> um, so I think that there will be more focus on transferable skills. I think that's something that's impacting all, all workforce across Canada, that people want to be able to change and move and and grow their careers across sectors. There's gonna be less focus on um, specific industries and more on the soft skills and the transferable technical skills that um, can move between industries. I also think there's gonna be more focus on storytelling and relatable career information, uh, presenting the data in more friendly, non-mathy ways. Um, and then I, hope that there'll be more granularity in the actual data going forward. I mean, I think that anyone who works in labor market information has a very long wish list for what we what we would love to get out of StatsCan data. Um, I, I'm not sure how realistic that is, um, but it, it seems to be an ongoing ongoing desire. So I, I think that the more, the more people we have interested and the more usable the information is, the more usable the information will become, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And, and I really think now we're able to find out and the more we use it, we can find out better who is using what for what purposes and how can we segment it for different audiences? Because, you know, we can have uh, an older worker versus a student versus a newcomer, they all may need different types of information. And I think that's really where this next wave where we can curate and develop tools for specific users and use cases or for policymakers or for career practitioners that we can kind of start curating tools rather than just having one standard thing that fits everybody but doesn't serve anybody. Exactly. Anybody would like to add anything else about the next wave and the future of it next three to five years, or should I jump to the Q and A? Oh, Tony. Because I mean, unless you wanted to jump in here. Um, I think, uh, yeah, the storytelling aspect for sure is a big one. Uh, I mean, for us, the, the data hub that we're building with the Future Skills Center, I hope everybody will, will be using that and that will power of, uh, a variety of front-end tools. But more seriously, whether it's our data hub or other tools, I think, um, the mixture of non-traditional LMI data is also critical. I mean, we all know after the pandemic, just how important information on childcare, education services, and so on are for parents, and therefore what they're able to do in terms of work and work hours, setting their schedules. That's something that pre-pandemic we didn't really think of as like labor market information, but super relevant for people making career decisions. So that's one piece. The other is the labor force survey is very, very useful in tracking trends. It's a survey of 100,000 people roughly every month. It is always going to be limited in terms of how granular you can get. The ultimate source of information, if we want really granular data, is administrative data that needs a variety of improvements, has you know, particular and important privacy considerations in using it. But even with the administrative data, tax files and so on that we have access to, there's a big delay between when that data, the reference period, the year that it's for, and when it's available for analysis. And I think closing that lag is, is going to be a big piece and much easier than expanding the labor force survey and increasing the response burden on Canadians, um, which is a challenge already. And what about, uh, Tony, I guess we're both all familiar. What about job scraping data? How does that fit into the, into the equation? Uh, Go ahead. We've used some job scraping data um, to help filter out what skills there are in specific industries. That's too challenging 
to get, um, well, we can get it sometimes from ONET, but Canadian industry is a little bit different sometimes. So we want to pull relevant Canadian examples. Uh, where we found that it's not that helpful is in emerging industries or um, growing regional uh, trends. So um, if it's a new sector or a new sector to a region, there's not a lot of postings available, or it might be one company that's hiring a whole bunch of workers that is skewing the data. So, I mean, I think it's a definitely um, a tool to use, but I, it's a tool to use in conjunction with others. Um, it can't be your sole, sole source, unfortunately, not yet anyway, I don't know. But Brianne said we are using several job scraping based LMI tools um, on the front lines, and there are certainly certain gaping holes in how the data is handled. Um, one being um, job postings versus job, but sorry, um, frequency versus importance of skills, just because we were talking about skills. Uh, we did a we did a search for baker jobs in our particular region, for example, and the top skill came back as Yiddish ones. And we're like, Yiddish? What does Yiddish has to do with this? Um, and obviously, that would have thrown off somebody who didn't know what they were doing. Uh, but then when we dug down, it turned out that there was a kosher bakery in the in that particular region who had put out a call for twenty bakers, and they wanted to hire for kosher cooking. So Yiddish was the common language of the space. And that has completely skewed our data. And like, you know, in terms of finding the skills, it was uh, destructive to the work. Uh, so there's several really big holes, but I also think that there are emerging tools, and I don't want to drop names here, but there's a couple of tools that we've used that are really good about cleaning up that data. It's updated frequently, and it can be drilled down to the region, like to the neighborhood level. Uh, where jobs are coming. The big problem with the job scraping thing is that the jobs are definitely um, middle class and urban jobs are posted way more frequently on job, job boards than our rural and non-professional white collar jobs. And for our sector, for our particular vulnerable job seekers, um, that's definitely a blank spot. Perfect. Well, I think I'm going to jump over to the Q&A section because I think we've got a lot of really great questions from, from, our, from the audience. So I'm going to start with the one question that I think is on the mind of many people, and it's from Tonic. We've heard a lot, lot lately about the Great Re Resignation in Canada. What is the magnitude of it in Canada, I guess from a quantitative, and how and what are the industries most effective? Now, I think it's really great that that we have somebody from industry, somebody from research, and somebody on the front lines. Maybe each of you could share your little uh, perspective on this or what your thoughts are? If I may, I don't know about it, uh, the, the great resignation industry by industry, and this might differ, but overall, there's no evidence of a great resignation in Canada. It is only in the United States. The challenge is we don't have very good metrics on um, quit rates in the terms of the gross flow, maybe leaving jobs. There are some data points in the labor force survey we can use, and those data far are not showing any kind of great churn or people switching jobs or exiting the labor market like you see in the United States. Now that might differ by region or by, uh, by industry, but overall we don't see that pattern yet in Canada. Yeah, I think in energy we do see um, some of the service sector workers uh, have chosen to leave the industry and move on. I, I don't think that's necessarily anything new. Um, I think that the pandemic uh, exasperated the industry and made people more aware of think opportunities that they can have that may not pay as much, but that are closer to home and allow them to be home with their families. So that subsector of the energy industry definitely um, is, is tight right now. Um, but I don't know that it's a great resignation. I don't, I, yeah. That's, that seems like a inflation of, of, of what we're seeing. I agree with Brianne. I don't think it's, it's um, great. I mean, there are obviously a lot of people are leaving the hospitality and food service industry, and there's been a, 
uh, there's been a turn in the population, but it's also attracting different people who are attracted to certain qualities of the industry. For example, the flexibility in hours, the fact that you don't need a high school diploma to sort of get an entry level job uh, or a higher education. The fact that you gain enormous amounts of transferable skills that open the door to a lot of other industries that might have other ways to require higher education. Uh, for example, uh, our room attendants transitioning to healthcare cleaning. Um, a, that's a lot of um, relevant transferable skills that they can take with them if they start as a room attendant. Um, so it's been a change. It hasn't been a resignation per se or a huge exit in that sense. Perfect. Thanks for answering that question. I know it's top of the mind, but yeah, there's a lot of kind of what's true, what's real, what's actually happening. Uh, I will put like, an asterisk that I agree with what, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, um, that with, with Tony said, perhaps this is just my impression because we don't have the data and the people who come to our door are the ones who want to go to work. So we are sort of not seeing the totality of the population and we don't have the data to back up what I just said, so. <laughs> <laughs> you're just your, what you're seeing, your window. Just my particular point of view, yeah. Perfect. I guess this is another one. Uh, people always talk about, you know, advising people about like what are the qualifications, but what are, somebody's asked, Tracy Campbell is asking, how will LMI in the future help individuals evaluate their skills, knowledge, and experience? I think that's one real interesting point of, if somebody's a job seeker and looking to get another job, how do they look at the skills they have and how do they, use that in assessment of where there's possible opportunities? You know, we have uh, tried to put together a few tools to help people do that over the years. And um, it's, it's a challenge. And I don't know that we've landed on a perfect way. Um, at this point in some of our VR experiences, uh, you do certain tasks and the end tells you what kind of you were good at. Um, the challenge there is you might just be bad at VR or good at VR. And so I'm not sure it's really, um, evaluating your, your true skills, but it does give you a sense of if you enjoyed doing this, this is a, a strength in these types of careers. Um, we have also tried just listing some of those aptitudes and skills, um, and getting people to rate how they thought how, how they thought that they were out of like a three scale, three star, excellent or, or in need of development. Um, and we found people always thought they were excellent. Um, and it's the same thing for employers. If you're asking employers, what level of this skill do you need? They will always tend, I shouldn't say always, they tend to choose, they want an expert. But in reality, when it comes down to hiring, there are a number of skills that they're willing to train internally. So um, I'm not sure that we've, I, I don't know that we have a good answer there, Tracy. Um, I do hope that there's more and more uh, skills evaluation tools out there. And the more tools that we have, the more people can see where their strengths are and the more employers can understand what they're actually looking for. Um, yeah, that's my view anyway. Yeah, skills are, are, are really hard to assess. I mean, if you even look at Excel, Excel use, what, what does that even mean? There's people and that, and many of them are industry specific and there's a whole lot of variants. So yeah, it's, it's something that everybody wants to know what the skills are needed, but there's so much variance within it. I'm going to answer Vanessa's question. And I, I think this might be maybe something that Tony would be able to answer. Um, how would the new NOC system changes, change, change the way career consultants provide guide job seekers? Uh, very good question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. So the, the new NOC system, just a bit of background for folks who might not be familiar. Uh, every 10 years, the statistical classification we use for occupations or jobs uh, is updated. The 2021 NOx system, the, the structure of it has been announced. It's on StatsCan's website now. The first set of data available in that structure will come out late next year, 2022, uh, as part of the census. 
and then that will be added to the labor force survey meaning it will be a couple of years yet still before that data is really, uh, that structure of information is applied to available labor market information. Um, I would like to say it will aid uh, folks. Um, I would, uh, but I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it's still gonna be limited in terms of how detailed the occupations are. There are some benefits. Data scientist becomes its own occupational category. Uh, so I've, I've very excitedly told the team of data scientists at LMIC that they will start to exist late next year. They're happy. <laughs> um, the other big benefit of it uh, beyond updating and, and having some more reasonable labels attached is the current NOC skill system. Some of you might be familiar with this ABCD ranking. Uh, which is a misnomer. It's not skills. It's the education level typically required. Um, in the new NOC system, this will now be relabeled tier um, training, education, experience, and uh, something else, Require requirements. I forget what the R stands for now, but it's a five-level hierarchy labeled much more clearly in line with the type of educational requirement uh, needed for the job. And I think that will help demystify some of the information out there uh, and clarify what's a educational requirement or qualification for skills. So I think that will be a big benefit. Perfect. Thanks, Tony. Can get a gazelle. I wanted to add, and I don't, I guess it's about the human element of it. It's about the wraparound supports that an individual would also need aside from their skills and their competencies to be job ready and able to join the labor market. Uh, even whatever information. So it's having a tool that helps sort of assess that as well alongside their skills and in their job readiness and their ability to, um, and the needs, social economic needs that they might have before they're ready to turn back to work that needs to be included in such an assessment beyond just education and, and skills levels. Thanks, Gazelle. And continuing on, on underrepresented groups, we have a question from Emmanuel Mellis. For underrepresenting group, including Black communities, barriers to employment are high, and the unemployment and underemployment seem to persist. How can LMI be utilized to influence government policies and invest to invest in inequity? At HWTC, we collect more than 300 data points on every individual. And I think and that data we only ever use for internal purposes. It never gets verified or, or matched up against the labor market information that's coming in externally and informing that for us on, in terms of bigger picture. So having those mechanisms in place where program level data can also inform local level LMI um, for racialized groups, for particularly vulnerable groups, um, is, is, would be a huge um, boom to our ability to understand our data and navigate it and make it useful to our participants. And I would just add to that, that uh, it, it's a great question and a, and a big challenging one for sure. Um, and I think the existing sort of career service community employment services out there are sort of working in that direction to support underrepresented groups. One of the problems we've had in the past is honestly, we've been flying blind. The labor force survey only last year started collecting data on racialized Canadians and their self-identification of the groups that they fall into. Prior to that, we had to rely on the census once every five years, very out of date, gave us a baseline point, but now we actually have a tool to start measuring how big that gap is, how big that challenge is, and whether or not policies that we're implementing are starting to close that gap. So at least we can track the progress we're making. And I think there's a variety of different uh, approaches as Gazelle was mentioning to provide those services and help people. Yeah, we're, um, we've started tracking some of that data as well. Um, and looking not only at the overall representation of these groups, but the types of roles that they're in. Um, they're often not the same types of roles that are um, white, frequently male uh, workers are in. And so how do we increase the chances for success and other opportunities once they are employed um, is the other piece that we're looking at. Thanks, Brandon. Oh, Gazelle? Oh, thanks, Brandon. Yeah, I, it's, it's really important that I think this information is included in the labor force survey because 
if we look at COVID, if it's just based on the census data and we have a four-year gap, it's, it's really difficult to assess what's actually happening. Um, we're approaching time, so I think I only have one question left. So I'll ask uh, this one by Omar Hussein. Since uh, the need for immigrant talents continued to grow, is there an effort in place to inform IRCC and immigrant serving organizations programming with LMI tools and key findings per region? Uh, for us, anything that we release um, or we produce is released on our website and available for free. Uh, we work regularly with the immigrant serving agencies and other community agencies um, across Canada, specifically in Western Canada where industry kind of mainly operates. But yeah, we're always looking to share the information and help, help those community agencies be able to um, make the best decisions that they can. Thanks. Maybe we'll do one more. Speaking of limitations in LMI data, are you talking about consideration both English and French job postings? Uh, yes, so our partner in collecting online job postings, vicinity jobs, uh, has now started collecting jobs in both official languages. And we're starting a new project now actually with them to start categorizing job postings in terms of whether English is required, an asset or not required, and French is required, an asset or not required. Uh, I think this is a critical piece to, to measure the skill demand for those particular official languages, of course. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a critical thing. Not every uh, job collection, uh, job posting collection firm does that. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a problem we face in some of the data. Perfect. Well, there's so many more questions. One, I'll try and squeeze in one more. Maybe Tony, you could quickly ask, is it possible for researchers to access LMI as a micro data file? So maybe you can maybe say through the LMI hub, how can people access this data or through the initiatives, how can people best access this data? Sorry, is it about micro data or data, granular data? Yeah, a micro data file. How can researchers access LMI? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple for the labor force survey. There are a couple of access points for um, the micro data. Um, follow up with me, shoot me an email, uh, check out our website. I can tell you more, but the public use micro files, PUMF is one source. The other that we've relied on a lot in the pandemic is the real-time remote access system, RTRA. Uh, it's a great way to access data, uh, cut it. It's a bit of a weird thing to get used to. It's, it's quite bespoke, but uh, I highly recommend it. Um, and for other needs, yeah, uh, feel free to reach out. Perfect. Well, I think we're running short on time. And I know there's so many questions. And thank you all for participating. And thank you, panelists, for answering such great questions. And for answering and providing such great comments and for really getting more into the nitty gritty of LMI. And I'm gonna hand it off to Pedro for some just closing comments. Uh, thanks very much, Ron. Great job moderating the panel. Thank you again. Uh, and of course, Gazal, Brianna and Tony, uh, you guys really did bring uh, some texture uh, and some insights into this conversation that I think we've all appreciated. Um, at its high point, we had almost 200 people participate in this conversation, which just gives you a sense of uh, just how important this is and how much all of us across the ecosystem see uh, better LMI as a, uh, a really important, um, uh, uh, really important orienting factor for us to move forward. I um, also love the level of engagement uh, from, um, uh, from all of you uh, who are watching and listening to this conversation and leaning in and adding your own comments. Uh, thank you so much for the range of questions. And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, uh, one, of, one of the realities in this area is that there are often a lot more questions than there are answers, and that just makes uh, our curiosity and our innovation work in this area even more important. Um, I, I, just, I wanted to uh, just highlight Vanessa Lee's question, which, which I thought was terrific uh, around uh, the connection between uh, the new NOC and, of course, how that can sharpen LMI on career guidance. And that was a really important thread running through this, uh, through this conversation. And Tony, you really touched on it, um, that when it comes to LMI, skills is sort of the next frontier, right? How, how we really start to capture that in our data and align it with other data points so that we can start to focus on skills more than jobs, right? Um, so thank you so much for those insights. And this is certainly a conversation that will continue. Um, I invite you to tell your, your, your friends and colleagues about, uh, about uh, uh, the past hour. There, it, we are going to have a recording of the session, and we will distribute that. 
Um, and just before I close, I just wanted to flag a couple of things that are coming up. Um, first of all, as we like to say at FSC, skills are a necessary but not sufficient condition uh, for decent work. Um, and so we are very excited about um, an open call for expressions of interest that we recently uh, that we recently launched on research into the quality of work. Uh, I know that this is an, an issue that even today was um, uh, was an undercurrent to a lot of discussion around the links between um, uh, you know equity and labor market information and the need for us to scratch the surface on questions around who's doing well and who's not. And so if you're interested in submitting a proposal when it comes to the link between skills and quality of work and all of its dimensions, please do check out our website. The deadline is coming up on November 25th. I'm very excited about diving into this area as I know many of you are as well. Um, and secondly, uh, the conversation does continue because this February we are organizing our very first Future Skills Summit uh, under the banner of driving action in Canada's skills ecosystem. And we'll feature plenary sessions, panel discussions, case studies, um, and really uh, also a little bit of fun, hopefully, uh, to bring some brightness into what has been a rather difficult period for all of us as we've learned all kinds of new ways of working. So it'll be great uh, to see many of you there and to continue these conversations. Check out our website. Uh, be sure to register for uh, both our coming summit as well as the rest of our sessions. Um, finally, I also encourage you to visit our community of practice, which Ron knows very well because Magnet is our lead partner in building a digital infrastructure for us to continue to work together, learn together, and imagine the future of skills together. So please do check out our community of practice, uh, sign up, and uh, become part of the conversation. Thanks very much, everyone, again, for attending. Look forward to seeing you at the next event, and uh, have a great, safe week. Ciao. Thank you.